I'm Sophia, and this is the ultimate podcast for celebrating all things wonderful about our beautiful island. Welcome to Destination Cyprus. Hi everyone, welcome back to Destination Cyprus, Cybarco's podcast that celebrates all things wonderful about our beautiful island. I was at the Diaspora Forum a few days ago and I bumped into somebody that I've known for over 15 years. And uh, while we were chatting away, I discovered that not only has she come and gone two, three times, but she's also now considering coming back to Cyprus. So I thought, well, here's the perfect opportunity to talk to somebody who's obviously got Cyprus running through her veins. And uh, she has a notable career as well that takes me back, and we'll talk all about that in a second, and uh, a career that revolves around what I would say is integral to everything that we do, everything that we are, words. So, Andrianne, welcome to Destination Cyprus. Sophia Moore, thank you so much for inviting me. I feel honoured to be here, to be honest. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure. It's so thank lovely you. to see you again. It <clears throat> feels like no time has passed at all since we met at Limassol Marina. And uh, you you were the Cyprus Weekly uh, correspondent, a journalist right. for, for Limassol, which was amazing because it gave me the opportunity to engage in stories uh, and behind the scenes access to the project at the time when we were building it. But before we go there, I want to go back to the beginning because like I said before, when we were chatting the other day, I, I genuinely had no idea how, how many times you've obviously packed, unpacked and unsettled yourself. So I thought that you were in Cyprus until I met you, uh, having not realised, of course, that you um, grew up in the UK. So you went to a Streatham Hill and Clapham High School, which is a, a girls' school. So we want to hear yes. a little bit about that afterwards. <clears throat> and then you went on to London University where you did your BA honours in English and Drama. And, and that explains the rest of the rundown, which we'll talk about. But you've had an incredibly um, diverse career. And I, I love the breadth of it because there's a lot that I can relate to. So rather than me sort of running through this, I think I'd like to hand mm. over to you to um, if you can just tell us a little bit about, obviously, the Filippo in the name and uh, then how you came to be in the UK and then how you ended up back in Cyprus when I met you. Wow, yes, gosh. Um, <clears throat> I feel I've known you all my life, which is really very odd. But then I guess I've also known your family, which is, I think, why I feel I know you. And well, obviously, I do know you now, but having met you, as you say, sort of about 15 years ago. But um, yes, I am Andrianne Philippou, born and raised in London, um, of, you know, Greek origin. My parents, both Greek Cypriot now, sadly, no longer with us. But um, it's been a long journey and interestingly, one that when I came for the first time to Cyprus, I was nine years old, and it was one of those occasions when um, it's the first time we'd ever travelled, my younger sister and I, with my mum. Dad was of, of the mind that the entire family should never travel together, similarly to the royal family, where just in case, you know, let's separate the the people in the in the clan. So mum and my sister and I came over here when I was nine, and the memories and the the experiences then um, have left a real sort of indelible print really in my mind and in my, I suppose in my soul because they weren't all happy in that, you know, we'd come over, one of my yayas at the time was, was on her deathbed, bless her, up in uh, the village in Sava. But the experiences I had on that trip... And then coming backwards and forwards, as you say, from the UK to Cyprus and learning to appreciate more every single journey uh, about the culture, some of which was really very alien to me, I have to say at the time, because we were so westernised mm. in, in the UK. Um, it sort of took me a long time to really appreciate and try and and align those two different types of culture um, 
in any way that felt um, comfortable for me. I, I think I was, I think we've spoken about this before mm. where, you know, growing up in the West with the very strong Cypriot heritage that we have and the culture and the Diaspora Forum was um, sort of alluded to that for some of the panel sessions. There was that sense of where do I actually belong? Mm. You know, who am I? Where do I fit? And I remember at my lovely Girls Public Day School Trust school, which was very proper, etc., cetera, um, all girls school, but I never really felt I belonged there. Mm. And yet I never really felt I was a real Cypriot because I was that person that had a foot in both camps, really. And, um, yeah, it was an interesting time. And and then, I mean, I, I don't know how much you want to, me to sort of delve into that, but, but I spent all my formative years, really, in the UK, studied, um, worked, etc. And then... I actually made the decision to come to Cyprus and live here with my two sons who were nine and four at the time um, for very personal, quite traumatising reasons, really a lifestyle change, just getting away mm. um, and coming here because my parents by then had retired to their homeland, Cyprus, and were living here. And I needed to know I had the bosom of my family to sort of come to and so that's I think when you and I will have met in that nine year period from 2004 to 2013 mm. which seems a lifetime ago now and yet it feels like yesterday at, certainly on this trip and when we met as you say a few days ago reconnected after a, a, quite a, a long gap it just feels like yesterday you know let's go and have a, a lovely coffee and let's go have a walk on the Molon and, you know, it, there's something about that period of time, which is a long time, but actually is nothing in, in the real sense, because I think we all know who we are, if that makes sense. It does, it does. <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I loved listening to that because there's so much there that I relate to. And uh, it, it's becoming more common now to meet people like us who either have grown up abroad and come back to their roots or who have parents who are different nationalities so this this kind of almost identity crisis and lack of sense of belonging is something that i i feel more of us are connecting on now and uh, also the the dilemma of do i stay do i go and i think that's one of the reasons why we started this podcast because there are so um, many talented people, creative minds uh, who could easily stay away from Cyprus and have fantastic careers. And it's it's a it's a sacrifice and a compromise. But amazingly, so many people come back. There's this magnetism to the island. And that's what struck me about our conversation, because now you're obviously <clears throat> at a point in your life where you're thinking, ah, do I come back? But we're not quite there yet. No. So <laughs> you've left us at 2004-ish, um, uh, when the boys were nine and four. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, the... The, the career progress. So after English and drama, obviously you you did some comedy club and events yes. work, which oh sounds God. massively exciting. Tell it, me a little bit about that. I'm obviously I'm I'm a, a little bit older than than you are, but I don't know whether you were around for the sort of alternative comedy um, onslaught that kicked in in the eighties and nineties in the UK. But that was really where I I started working in the entertainment world. I mean I. I, I did English and drama, as you say. Um, and then I did sort of, you know, the practical things, video and conference production and various other sort of normal jobs. But all the way through, I had worked at the weekends in the evenings at my friend's fantastic comedy club called Jonglers in Battersea. And from that, we developed a promotions um, side of the agency where we would put together a dedicated and sort of customised entertainment packages for corporate companies so um, as a result of that I mean I was working with people who you know it sounds bizarre now but when you're giving Jack D a tryout spot or Lee Evans or you know and Rory Bremner's on your 
sort of uh, guest list for a, a, you know a company do and all all of the names that we associate now and are very sort of mainstream Paul Merton or you know Lenny Henry would come along and mm. look at new talent all of that sort of stuff and it was great because it was a very dynamic and innovative time and I think um uh, it was just a, um a vibrant time where things were happening, which I think probably were a bit more limited now because of everything that's moved on with, you know, dare I say it, sort of the woke I- idea oh, where, you know, yes. you have to be mindful of what you say and how you say that's it. That's an entire offending. podcast episode, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Great but for, times, though. For me, it was an amazing time mm. and right in the middle of it. And really, as a result of that, I was headhunted by Michael Hull at the time, who was launching a... a a nightly chat show with Derek Jameson um, and invited me to join the team and book acts Mm -hmm. every night. And then from there, I went on to join the BBC and do a similar thing with The Wogan Show and various other quite iconic productions. And so I was kind of, you know, had I... Had I been deliberately trying to get into the the world of television, I don't think I'd have had a clue. But somehow through comedy, I was I, I was known, I think, in, in that sense. And so I just morphed into a television role and a television career. And then, as occasionally happens, I don't think I would necessarily happens to say it happens to everybody, but I got married <laughs> when you get <laughs> and when <laughs> you <laughs> I know exactly it was a bit like that and then somehow I loved I loved my job I was very good at it and I really enjoyed what I was doing but when I was pregnant with my first child um I think I stopped driving to TV center when I was eight and a half months pregnant because I couldn't fit behind my mini <laughs> you know my stomach was so big so but um at that point, there were some complications with my first son, some potential medical complications. And, you know, it's a no brainer for me. Um, my son came first. So and then we moved to Bristol and then uh, things changed. So I think my my television career really went into another dimension. And when we moved to Bristol and when um Thankfully, my my son, my oldest son, Harry, uh, is fine and was fine. Um, I morphed again and went into sort of corporate hospitality and corporate communications. And so that opened up a whole other avenue, really, of um, potential career path because, um, yeah, it was just too complicated to try and start Mm -hmm. again and work in, you know, I was I was invited to join other production companies but the hours weren't great and for me it's you know the whole idea of communication and working in an industry which is creative and gives you the the potential to be as um as part of a of a process with all the people that you meet and the creativity that you can sort of bring to the party that was enough then with raising a family and mm. doing everything else. But actually, in the end, 10 years of, of living in the Southwest and by then a second child, there was something missing and it wasn't it wasn't the right environment for me and my boys. And sadly, my marriage wasn't going in the direction I was really hoping it would have and I just decided I needed to come away and I came to and I came to Cyprus and that was you know that whole idea of of where do I belong I mean my parents had come back here at then at that time to retire and they um that was an interesting experience for them because once they did return having left pre you know um, well well well, it was pre-74 they were both both in the UK, my dad in 1950 and my mum in 1955, and they had the arranged marriage, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but when they came here in 1991, I think it was, um, they were aliens. They were classed as aliens. So that was a really interesting concept for them to, to yeah. handle because they they adjusted eventually, but I think they always felt a little bit out. Of out. It. And so hence that whole idea of, you know, where do you belong? Where Where is home? Where is, you know, where do you consider 
your identity to be. Um, and even when I was here from 2004 to 2013, I mean, it, I, think I, I think I played on that a little bit. Because it, when it suited me, I was very Cypriot. Oh, of course. <laughs> Don't when, we all do that? Switch on, yeah, switch off. Exactly. And But again, I think I've always done that. And that's one of the joys of having a multiracial sort of environment and culture to draw on. I remember once coming home from school when I was at Streatham High. And uh, I was on the bus on the top of a double-decker bus <laughs> with a girlfriend. And there were these two guys sat in front of us talking about me and my friend. And, of course, talking about us in Greek, completely oh, oblivious to the those, fact. Love those occasions. It, it was just so classic. And I remember when I... Um, when I came to get off at my stop with my, my girlfriend and I just turned to them and said, well, yeah, but, you know, we're not interested. Thanks very much. And sort of it was just one of those priceless moments where they just looked at us and thought, oh, my God, we had no idea. And of course, why would they? Because, no. you know, we looked like very English proper schoolgirls. You know, I was having a chat with um, uh, Gostas at the forum and he said something that was very interesting. Uh, and again, how wonderful that so many people have this same, this same issue and dilemma. And as soon as they meet, there's this instant click. Yeah. And he said, he said, no, I've changed the way I think. I don't think, and I'll adjust it for, for, for my purposes and yours now. He says, I never think I'm 50% English, 50% Cypriot. When I'm in Cyprus, I'm 100% of one. And when I'm in England, I'm he said, I adjust my mindset yeah. and I have that advantage that I can be 100% whatever I choose because it's that easy for us to slip in and out. Um, and I, I often felt that as well. But there is... I think um, if when if it all boils down to what do you feel like the most and where do you belong? I mean, there, there's no doubt about it in my mind. I mean, I'm I'm Cypriot. I'm you know yeah, there, there's absolutely. there's nothing that could possibly position me in a situation where I would say I feel more British. That there's a lot of British in me, and mm. I'm I'm very thankful for that. But no. Definitely. I feel the same. Through and through. I absolutely feel the same. And I think what's really interesting is because for quite a, a while, and I think it's part of the, you know, being a mum, bringing your kids a, away to a, a, a strange land, because obviously it's not mm. their home. Oh. Um, the UK was their home. You know, London and, and Surrey and the home counties was their home until we went to Bristol. But, but it's interesting because now that they are older and wiser, my children, they're now 29 and 24. Um, and we've been here together for a period of time. Um, my oldest is still with me until we go back next uh, next week, I think. Um, they feel really grounded here mm. and very settled here in a way that when we were here from 2004 to 2013, given it was a very traumatic time that we were all going through and, and adjusting and starting and rebuilding my life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, I never felt comfortable that I had put the, the children through that yeah. because I knew how unsettling it was, that sense of being in the sixth form at school and, you know, my friends being able to go out to parties and do this and you're, you're conscious of the fact that your family values are much more strict and much more disciplined and di fabiosioso and et cetera. You know, it's all of those things that, that we, as I, certainly I was as a, Greek Cypriot girl in London was raised in, with a very sort of strict set mm. of of practices for behaviour for everything, and um, I I always felt slightly mm. uncomfortable with with all of that, and I was very anxious that my children didn't feel the same when they were here, and fast forward, you know to their ages now and I suppose their maturity the way they've developed and who they are as people through all of the cultural influences that they have been a part of they feel really quite settled quite grounded and I think I think as a society we and this is one of the beautiful things that we've loved about Cyprus it's a very international um, platform and landscape and I think it's a very we're, we're comfortable here with the transience of everything. Mm. You know, you come and you go. Um, people return a few years 
down the line, uh, indeed, you know, uh, it's kind of the norm. It's okay to be backwards and forwards. There doesn't have to be that, you know, where you put down roots and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that. And I think my children now are, you know, really happy with the opportunities they had to be here to experience Cyprus, even at that young age. And it wasn't an easy time for them, I'll be really honest. Um, And then, you know, now to really appreciate the benefit of that that Mm. they have had. I I have to just tell you something, Sophia, that um, were you aware that your mum, Mrs P, taught taught, um, Alexi, my youngest, in his reception year at Foley's? You know, I used to go and, and meet all the kids, so I do remember. And actually... I think Mrs. P is my mother. I think Miss P had Harry taught Harry yeah. as well. And he adored her. And I mean, you know, it's very, it, it's like, I feel I'm, I, and I obviously worked with your, your dad for a period of time. I feel like I've known your Ma, entire family. Tu don I know. On this I know. So it's, crazy, so we all know each crazy, other. Crazy. It's so, oh, it's fantastic though. It, it is. It's it amazing. Is, um, it's <clears> like <throat> you said, it, it's home and it it takes a village, doesn't it? And I think yeah, it's nice definitely. that you, you've always got someone you can turn to for anything. Um, and obviously before before we go past 2013, because um, I, I don't know how timely, I don't know if you left in 2013 because of the, the bank yeah. crisis or not, you yeah, did. Okay. I did. I mean, so, it, essentially what happened, because I'd, I'd been with the Cyprus Weekly for four years. I mean, w- within that nine year period of being here, I- I'd sort of, again, transitioned from all sorts of things, from mm. supply teaching and work, and then um, set up my own PR agency, I was doing a lot of copywriting, a lot of uh, work with advertising agencies, account managing, all sorts of projects, etc. And, um, and yes, the last four years, which I thoroughly enjoyed, was the Limassol correspondent role for the weekly. And I was devastated, actually, because when the crisis hit, literally the um, the newspaper just made some very sort of drastic changes and they slashed salaries, mine being one of them, you know, um, it was Im- impossible. Yeah. It was untenable for me to stay because everything as a freelance, you know, you just... It's down to the bone, isn't it? Of so, course, what and a bizarre time 2013 was, yeah. was. I mean, I think everybody was numb. None it of us knew. Incredible. Everything was hanging in the balance. But yeah. but this newspaper, Andrian, I mean, I, my, I just remember weekends. I remember on a Friday, Dad grabbing a Cypress yeah. Weekly for Mum. And then I remember on a Saturday morning getting in the car and going off to Ladies Mile. And then we'd come back from <laughs> Ladies Mile and we'd watch, it was either Wimbledon or the Love Boat. A oh, bit of Love okay. Boat going on. <laughs> but I mean, we had this this carefree childhood in Cyprus. And for, for people with an expat or an English-speaking parent... This was the holy grail. Mm. I mean, Cyprus Weekly was everything because you'd flip to the back and check what was on TV. Then you'd yeah. have your cinema listings eventually. It was just a one-shop stop for everything. And uh, it was, I mean, these, you've brought these in yes. today. Honestly, nearly brought tears to my eyes because these are all the clippings of the the stories you wrote for Limassol Marina, which was... You know, groundbreaking at the time, was, and I loved absolutely. it because we used to get the Limassol correspondents down to the project, and you you were just a fixture. It was like you were part of the extended team, and I love this one here. A day, what was it? A day in the life of a ficus tree, if you don't mind, because this is please. It I was mean, one anybody, of my favorites. anybody who drives through the marina will see the roundabout with this massive ficus tree, and uh, I. This is why I really, I really knew that there'd be added value in speaking to you, not only because of your story about Cyprus, but also the value of words. It's become so, so poignant uh, these days, the art of communication, which is Mm. sadly dwindling. I mean, because now in communication, people might just use two words or a hashtag and that's the the depth of communication unless you're reading long form or um listening to podcasts so I just it it really shocked me how it took me back to something I had forgotten and you took me there and it was so vivid 
Whilst the Limassol Marina continues to make its dramatic groundbreaking impact on the landscape of Limassol, a different type of groundbreaking project was underway very recently on the site, one that will also have a lasting impact. The historic 60-year-old Ficus tree, an important fixture on the site for generations of workers at the port area who've sought shade beneath its branches for decades, has been carefully uprooted and repositioned to stand tall at the roundabout that will connect Limassol Marina's residences restaurants and shops to the public road network. So this was 2013. In a carefully executed labour of precision engineering, <laughs> planning and tender loving care, according to the PR officer, me, the project's chief foreman and eight men in safety gear executed their mammoth task brilliantly. And then, and then I remembered it all came flooding back. Sophia, who recorded the day's activities on film, said it honestly felt as if they were transporting the most valuable and fragile sculpture in the world to its podium in a, musician, in a museum. They did a wonderful job, and every time I drive towards the project and around the roundabout, I look at the Ficus tree and smile. And it, it, it goes on to explain how there was a mobile crane, a truck yep. trailer, uh, a digger, <clears throat> They had to do the soil. They brought the water tank. They removed the roots one by one. And the history of the joint venture and the building that was left by the Brits and how many people had sat in the shade of this tree. And I just think what a beautiful story mm. and and how integral the people behind the words are to everything that we do and everything that we are. So let's talk a little bit about writing, because one of the things that I enjoyed reading um, about your career is that you say obviously that that it was the comedy and the the sort of the accidental uh, way into which you ended up in TV but i'm i'm inclined to say that there's something to be said for people who can do a little bit of everything and i and i think that that's been something that i have been so fortunate to experience in cyprus so if you if you can write if you've got mm. the, the gift with the copywriting, if you've got an outgoing personality and you're personable, and I know you've also done podcasting, if you're also, um, you know, skillful with organizing and coordinating people and planning events, there, there's such a huge entrepreneurial quality to that, that it can take you anywhere. And that's what I found in, in reading um, all about your career, that you've You've navigated through all the changes and writing is something that has seen you through the Absolutely. times. And I was looking today, I, the whole, the, the threads um, icon appeared on my Instagram. And when I saw the, the branding for threads, I thought how apt that was, yes. how you thread yeah. everything through words and letters. So tell us a little bit about, about writing specifically and where that passion grew from and what you've been doing with it since the Cypress Weekly and any anything you're planning to do with it in the future. Do you know, it's really interesting because when you invited me on and we were talking about the power of words, which is what this is all about, and and as any audience uh, member is going to realise, we love talking, you and I, and we've got, we've got <laughs> no. lots to say. But um, at uh, one of the roles I had in television was to interview a graphologist. And I remember him um, taking me aside, giving me a document to rewrite in my own handwriting, <clears throat> and then going away and analysing my... my um, Handwriting. Handwriting, thank you, my script. And um, he said to me, in fact, I've said that wrong. It was such a long time ago. I'm, it, he didn't know it was my handwriting. Um, uh, he had I, to guess. I had, he had to guess. And, and I had written this kind of um, document in my own script. And he analysed it. And there were several other scripts given to him. But he analysed mine, not knowing it was mine. And actually... Um, extracted out of it that my life was going to be taken up and I was going to have a career that was going to afford me a living through writing and that was back in my late 20s wow. and I and I mean that has always stayed with me in fact I was looking for that that particular bit of script that he analyzed I've got it hidden somewhere but 
various, you know, tucked away at home somewhere. But um, that always stayed with me. And it's interesting because everything I have done in, throughout my whole career has indeed um, required me to write um, in order to get me to the next stage or to be a part of whatever it was I was mm. doing at the time. And for me, writing, I think I always found a, a sort of a sanctuary almost in, in writing. I, you know, I've always journaled. I've always held, had a diary. I've always looked. I've, I've, I feel we've lost something very special in, in um, not writing letters. I, I don't know how uh, sometimes I pick up and I, I, leave, I, know. I find it such a struggle to actually write properly. Because we've just lost the yeah. art and we've just lost the love of... Yeah. Um, of pouring out on emotions, paper thoughts. our emotions and our thoughts and actually you know looking inward um and and putting it out there because there's something very special about reflecting i think on where we are at any given time in our lives and you know when you get get to sort of experience some of the fundamental things that life throws at you you know, births, deaths, all, all of those things, friendships, relationships, all, you know, if you're not recording it somehow, um, I know we've all got phones and everything we do yeah, is on it's the, the, but it's so, it's so different. Yeah, and I, and I find writing to be my, uh, it's just my, my leveler, you know, I can just stop and just write. And that's, and I was actually really devastated at the end of the Cyprus Weekly kind of period era. of my life and the era because I had to go back to the UK I had to get the boys back they had to finish their education there um for all sorts of other reasons and the critical one being the the sort of financial situation but it meant I had to start again and so I had to rebuild and what do I do what what's kind of one of my skills um and writing was right up there and I thought right well okay let's get on to this I actually offered my services to the Cyprus Weekly to be the London kind of voice from the capital city um, for them to sort of tap into and they just didn't at the time that I think so many other things were going on they just didn't take up my offer uh, which is a real shame because I think I think there's so much to share we we learn so much there's so much to um, understand about each other. Communication is so fundamental to me, and I think if only people were taught to communicate. I mean, I'm lucky. I feel that it's quite instinctive for me, mm. but I do feel that we don't spend nearly enough time mm. showing each other and showing our children, for example, in education how important it is to be able to communicate. Well, do they communicate anymore? I mean, this is the no, other thing. I don't that think if, they do. If, if the the latest form of communication is just sitting on a phone, I know that's not that's definitely not going to replace human contact. No, absolutely, because there's expression, there's um, nuance, and the intonation. Yeah, being able to be tactile, yeah. being able to express yourself mm. with your eyes. There's so much about communication that I think is is the running. It, it's the thread. It it kind of keeps everything together it's the glue that holds everything together and and that's why I'm so obsessed with writing and reading at the moment because it's the only thing that mm. that that calms me down I mean I just find that if I want to relax I will either read or write now yeah, absolutely. and the the beauty of writing is that once you've put those thoughts on paper they're there and it's and it's there for eternity, and it doesn't matter who reads it, doesn't matter who likes it, but it exists. And I think that's what's so beautiful about the written word, that it's once you've put it down, it's been released. It's been released, but it's also something that you can re, um, re-experience. You know, you, it, it triggers a memory. It, it triggers something really special that caused you to actually write it in, in the, the first, first place. place and I mean for example when I was in Cyprus uh, I went to two three I think writers retreats first time I'd ever been on a writers retreat was here in Cyprus and then I went again and again and now that I'm back in the UK I've been on writers retreats there as well because there's something fundamentally um, profound about being 
being at one with that sense of wanting to share something, not necessarily to get it published or or for anybody else to see it no. or to enjoy it or otherwise or critique it, but just for you to be able to express that and to share that. It's almost like your own therapy, isn't it? It's how you're, it's it's, how you're feeling in the moment. Yeah, it's, it's, it's real really, and it's, it yeah. means that you're present, which is something that we're not very good at doing anymore. Yeah. A lot of people are living in the past, they're living in the future, they're living in anxiety. Yeah. And it's like how many of us are actually 100% present. This podcast is one of the few opportunities I get to focus 100% on the person across the table from me. No phone to distract me, no pinging emails. When did it become okay to sit at a table with someone in a restaurant and instead of being with them, being with somebody else on the phone who wasn't invited to the dinner. I know. So the insanity of it is something that I think writing and reading and for people who have that form of expression and that need to express themselves and share, however they're sharing, whether, like you said, it could be that it's, in active groups or group therapy or psychotherapy, however it is that people are sharing their emotions to be able to put things on paper. And I'm looking at your pad because <laughs> I, I want, I think it would be lovely um, if you could share a poem that I saw that you'd written. Um, I, I will say no more. Can you just read it for us, please? Because I, I think it's a really good example of how you can transport somebody to a specific place. Okay, I will. Um, this was a very special moment for me because I was, at the time, um, working freelance here uh, as a fixer for external productions, television and film production companies coming over and I was kind of talent scout talent scouting no that was back in the day I was location scouting here and found myself going to Zilofago and a place called Bodamos Liobedri which I do you know it I don't know if you know it okay right I'm going to read you this is this is what manifested when I was there on location Bodamos Liobedri how still she lies waiting primed her movements languid, biding her time. The gentle swell as her strength garners power, the curling liquid bubbling on fire. She rises, her passion unleashed as before, relentless, now spent, her force sucked dry by the shore. Her crushing's hypnotic, she teases my form, her ebbing and flowing, her cadence forlorn. She builds to her peak and then she fades when she's ready. And I sense she is close, for her passage is steady. Again and again, never ending, forgiving, as gentle as rain when her fervour is hidden. Fear not my intrusion, I cannot compel you. Your magnitude conquers. Compliant within you I cower and tremble, my spirit ordained. For here, in your presence... All life entertained. Your essence enveloping, silky and smooth. Cool and constricting, you've nothing to prove. Simply giving and taking, your power intense. Your life force majestic. No beginning, no end. Beautiful. Thank you. You know, I can remember, I can remember when we used to do English literature at school, I can remember going on uh, school trips and the boys sitting in the back of the bus and the girls sitting at the front and us having this endless debate about the sciences versus <laughs> literature yeah. and languages. And I can remember even back then when we were only 16, but we used to say to the boys, you'll realise one day the value of literature. And there's so much about, about, people who can communicate and express themselves with words and how aligned it is with the way they express themselves in their relationships, their friendships. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding now, I'm, I'm at an age now where people around me are seeking to connect with their emotions and to understand their feelings and their traumas. So it, it was such a brilliant way to start life with the written word and with reading. So, um, beautiful poem. Are you, tell me a little bit about writing now. So you're still writing. In I'm work. still writing where I am now. I mean, I, I, 
in the UK, and, and I have been back there for, as you say, um, backwards and forwards, but there for about 10 years. So I've been working over there um, professionally as an editor uh, for a magazine, a publication, and I have been writing independently as well um, on with my poetry groups that I've created and, and run over there in, the, in Berkhamsted, where I live at the moment. And um, in my current role, I'm, again, it's all part of my... Uh, the elements of my position, uh, I'm writing, I'm editing, I'm proof reading, etc. So it's all still there. Mm. And it's that, it's that eternal, you know, sort of dilemma. <clears throat> I want to just sit and write my own stuff. I want to do my book, I want to do this, I've got several things that I've started. But when you're working full time, it's just juggling spinning plates and things so and this is the the beauty of coming back here which I have been toying with kind of you know and this trip has really consolidated my my thinking and is almost it's just given me permission to say yeah it's okay you know there's that whole sort of sense of I feel already this yearning to be writing now, you know, to be coming back here, basing myself in Cyprus, you know, living here again and just just doing it for myself properly. But of course, there's the, the sort of practicalities of life and work. Your and sort of uh, yeah. and, and where there's a will. And, and exactly. But I mean, the writing now that I'm doing is more professional, mm. you know, in terms of the technical content and writing within the practice that that I'm working for, for the company that that I am a part of. Um, I'm, what I'm yearning to do is write the sort of more soulful, more um, fulfilling parts, which is why I started the poetry group, um, which gives me a, a chance to be able to engage uh, with other like-minded people mm. and we all meet um, once a month and generate some really interesting sort of discussions based on our work and what we're offering, um, running open mics, you know, actually being able to to perform our work. Um, you know, one of my intentions over there is to um, set up a, a little poetry festival in nice. my town, um, which I would like to do. And, and one of the things that I'm here in Cyprus um, and interested to understand is being able to continue that and actually create and develop those sorts of mm. um, ideas here, which uh, what's lovely is how incredibly international Cyprus is I and how... You'll be shocked to find how much is going on. Um, so I probably you, will. You would, you would fit in and it would be seamless. There'd be a lot... Uh, there's a lot in the community that is being done and to have somebody like you come over to enhance that and strengthen what what's already been created would be great I, I feel there's so much opportunity mm. I think also if I'm honest because you know when I came over for those nine years with the boys it was a it was a complicated time and I think it was survival going into survival mode which you do um, as a single parent with two young children and then moving forward all those years later where everything the dust has settled everyone's calm you it's can all finally good. make it about you absolutely can't you? absolutely and I'm I just I feel there's so much possibility um I've loved this trip it's been fantastic meeting up with you and you know as you say the sort of the forum the diaspora forum I think it reconnected so many mm. people and ideas um, you know, it, it's one of those things I think we have to be ready for certain things to come back into our life um, and for us to be timing. receptive to them. And it is about the timing. Yeah. I mean, we've sort of talked about that before, but I feel, yeah, timing is all. And uh, having to come and readjust to Cyprus under circumstances like these where you said that you're you're ready to put pen to paper mm and uh, and do you and yeah is there is there something about cyprus because i do always i always ask people if there's something that they would change about cyprus is there something about the island that that 
you're worried about or you think might be a challenge, something that you'd like to change? You know, I was really thinking about this question. Um, but, okay, I think there is something I would love to change about Cyprus. I don't think it's going to be too much of a of an impact on me and my love for and passion for writing and how I move forward. But I just feel that if only um, Cyprus toned down its what I feel is an obsession with pyrotechnics. That's the one. <laughs> that's <laughs> I love it. That that's the that's thing. That's the that, first, Andrian. Uh, is it? Okay, well, I mean, I just feel what's this mania we have over here with the, the youth, you know, flares at football matches, fireworks every night. And Easter as well. Oh, Easter will be something that you've forgotten yeah, about. It's I, a I, shame because it, it sort of ruins the celebration. But there's also fireworks on a nightly basis now, weddings, I know, parties. But, but why? Because uh, apart from anything else, I just feel that the tinderbox, you know, elements of this island, the wildfires, the climate's changing. I mean, can't we just tone it down and not be so sort of um, flippant yeah, about that's fire? That's part of a bigger picture, isn't it? It's it part is. part of the whole it is. ESG and sustainability. Yeah. And it, it has to be part of a strategy. And I think you'll be pleased to find that when you're here more permanently, that there's so much effort being made for for change towards the positive. But obviously, it doesn't happen overnight, does it? So, it, I but think I it, love that though. And it, and it's tied <laughs> and it's tied in with the sort of obsession I th I feel to just make noise. We are a very kind of it noisy. Is. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, <laughs> it's all that. It's the hand yes, gestures that it I is. Love. It's all of that, and I know carnival is fabulous, and all uh, you know. That's I'm not in any way wishing to diminish the the kind Loudness. of quirkiness and the chaotic sort of you know sort of creativity that that we love and and we just adore on the island, but. The pyrotechnics, just keep them down a okay. bit. So we'll, that's, we'll, we'll, we'll make okay. sure we arrange that before your arrival. Thank you, Thank you very much. And uh, I, I think something we haven't touched on uh, before we wrap this up is, is the future, is the future of writing really? Because this is mm. something that fascinates me. And when we agreed that you were coming, I obviously approached you with the dilemma of, of what, what I call you. Uh, your mm. title, your profession. And it seems to me, present company included, that everybody's calling themselves a writer and an author these days, which is great on the one hand. It's fabulous that people can self-publish. It's great that people can hop onto Amazon and KDP and just, you know, press a button and there it is. Their work's available to everybody. Needless to say, the sales you make from self-published books can and can't be uh, tragically, ridiculously invisible and low. But how do you feel um, about the future of writing given the nature of the process? So, I mean, being able to get a literary agent to, to publish properly is a challenge. Magazines are dying out. Print, press, dying out. And then the rise of social media and now AI, where you can literally just type in, write me 500 words about X and it's done in two seconds. How are you feeling about all of that? Well, I think, I mean, AI is obviously there here, you know, and, and it's here to stay and it will uh, evolve. There's no, no mm. doubt about that. I still feel that... Writing, communicating, um, using tools like, you know, chatbots and, and AI is is actually really invaluable for certain companies, organisations, for people who need that additional uh, platform, really, mm -hmm. to, to enable them to create what they need for their company structure, their their audience, their commerciality, etc. That That's fine. I don't think it's going to mean that somehow writers are, um, you know, no longer necessary. I think you still need the human contact. You still need the the understanding of um, a qualified copywriter or professional sort of writer to be able to check through what 
technically is being created in, mm. on, a, on a chat bot because, um, I mean, I tried it myself, actually, with, I mean, we tend to use it at work, but I think companies are getting much more savvy now as well about how to safeguard the content that's going out on, you know, mm. uh, under their the banner of their organisation. Um, I still think you need to have checks and balances with the you know, the written form, it, you can't just rely on what's created um, through augmented intelligence or artificial intelligence to deliver something. I mean, I was reading something the other day about how um, the algorithms aren't nuanced enough, they're not intelligent enough at this stage to decipher, you know, I think they will get better and better mm. and it will become uh, easier in the future. But at the moment, you still need a uh, and you know, a journalist, you still need a writer to sort of be able to check through that no um, ghastly sort of errors are there or that the algorithm hasn't misinterpreted something and it's sending out a, a completely false message or content. I, I do, for me personally, I, I think the idea of, of, I suppose it's because I haven't, uh, when you, you were asking me how, you know, what, what, I consider myself, I am a writer, I haven't published a book yet, but I have had a lot of published work out there. And so I feel almost I'm, I'm cheating if I call myself an author or a writer, mm. um, because I'm, I'm a jobbing journalist, writer, copywriter, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I am, the moment I get my, my sort of book published, I will be happy to say I'm a writer. I know I, I am a writer. I do write. But it's just that that sort of, I suppose, that romantic, um, you know, element of, of can I really call myself a writer if I haven't really got... Well, how do you call it? It's not it's not credentials, is it? It's the... It's just that tangible... Work. Yeah. I, I, I just feel, I mean, I, I think with AI, you know, I use it at work sometimes if I wanted to recreate um and you know the flow of something if there's an, a, a way to improve it i'm happy to to try that out it's a bit like a thesaurus as but it, well but isn't it, it is because really that, that's exactly how i see it extract yeah. what you want um but yeah i mean usually usually you can tell if if it's yeah. if it's something that's been written and is being checked or adjusted if the foundation is there you can usually tell if it isn't there. It's, it's very obvious, very absolutely. blatant. And with that said, um, I one of the poetry group evenings, I gave the first two lines of a of of a topic and asked the group to create a poem with those two lines as their basis. And uh, and I did the same, um, but I used a chatbot and did it with AI. Didn't tell the the rest of the group that, of course, they did it. You know as they should <laughs> and um and my poem was appalling it was, it was lots of platitudes and a lot of sort of very sort of exactly as, as you would expect uh, lots of sort of rhyming couplets that were just really sort of quite trite really um whereas the rest of the group and and it was really interesting because when they were all reciting their work and I gave mine I, I would think I was in just fits of giggles all the time mm -hmm. because I just knew I had I had kind of not done the job properly, properly, but I deliberately wanted to see how it would be interpreted through, you know, AI. And uh, we all could tell in the end. I mean, obviously I told the team, but but it was very clear. So I think we've got a long way to go to, before we need to be worried, if I'm yeah. honest. And, um, well, I suppose print as well. So I know that now um, with your your publication. I mean, do you think, so the companies that you're working for now, do you think they'll continue to oh, put out magazines? Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, I don't know about you, but I absolutely, uh, you know, and just touch. that tangible sort of something to, to touch and to feel that sort of tactile um, paper mm. contact, you know, the, the, the cover of a you know, of a beautifully bound book, magazines, etc. I mean, there's something about there being able to take it with you, about. open it and read it. Um, and I, I think 
sure, the digital platforms and Kindle and everything else, they're fantastic. They they have their place. But I don't think you can replace. I was just going to say, do yeah. you, do, I don't find that I have the patience either. I think by default, when I'm on my phone or an iPad scrolling, it's harder for me to focus and read an entire article, yeah. whereas if it's in front of me, I've obviously opened it because I'm in relaxation mode. It's too many distractions on your phone and your iPad. There's notifications pinging, so you're in and out. You're trying to read, but you're not really reading. You're half reading. I totally agree. And also the holistic, aesthetic kind of joy that you get mm. from seeing something, the layout, how it looks, how someone set it, the fonts that are used, the colours. Yeah, without having to all, zoom in. Uh, all, all of that. And, and also, on a very purely selfish level... I don't want to be squinting my eyes on a tiny screen again. I mean, God, you know, it's bad enough I have to wear them for some some reading or, already. I don't want to be damaging them anymore. So if I can see a beautiful, you know, paper, magazine, um, you know, book, and it's, it, that's, to me, that is just really precious. Um, you know, I, clearly there are cost implications because the digital form, it, you know, everyone's trying to cost, uh cut corners and you know save costs etc but I don't think you can take away from the beauty of the written form in in a, a book or in a, a brochure um some I mean you know some really fantastic um magazines I, I remember the hotels here when I was writing the reflections uh, the Columbia magazines and and the various other, the Amethyst and yeah, the Four so Seasons. Eleni, Eleni Eleni Stoldas, Bolli, yeah, so that's uh, right. The, the hotel magazine, so all yeah. of, and they looked glorious. I mean, then they're very, you know, as a customer, as a client, they're you come and stay. To and they touch, are. Yeah. I mean, actually, and it's you. You miss that when course, I see absolutely. a good quality magazine now. Absolutely. I love to pick it up. So do I. And I think it's um, I you know, I think we've got a long way to go before they are eliminated. Mm. Or I certainly hope so because no, same. Um, you know, you need to, I think, have that engagement with something of quality. You can sense that. If you're just reading it on a screen, it's just, uh, you know. It's transient, isn't it? It really is. It um, really is. I wanted to ask about um, moving back to Cyprus, so if potentially that's something that you will be doing because we haven't really had time to run through every aspect of of your skill set but you did stuff with the Limassol the Limassol Jazz Festival um with TV productions in Cyprus obviously there's the events you were telling me you've done a uh, women in oh yeah, explain that to me I, I will explain yes okay well so uh, Loom magazine which obviously I, I'm now no longer editing because I left that when I was taken on board where I am now back in the UK but I was there for four years editing Loom magazine it's the international sort of b2b publication and the lubricants industry we're talking about automotive oils and um engineering um, manufacturing you know metal working fluids etc to just clarify so um with with lube magazine which and i knew nothing about lubricants really uh, when i okay. started there i don't i don't know quite how i got the job if i'm honest but but when i started there um it's a very male dominated mm. Uh, industry and imagine. sector you know or at least it was and always traditionally has been and I think within the first few months I thought well you know there are some really talented and very very highly skilled professional women in this industry too but they're not really given a voice so mm. I was determined to um, showcase them really and shine a spotlight on them and so I think in in fact I'm very proud of the fact that it was the last live event at the Institute of Directors in London that was held in 2021, mm. um, just COVID. pre-COVID. Literally, it was the last event held before they shut their doors for COVID. And it was the Women in the Lubricants Industry Conference. And it was the landmark event. It hadn't been held, uh, you know, women hadn't really been celebrated within the, the sector until that Amazing. time. Okay. And so I was really, really p proud of that. And then sort of two years later, post COVID sustainability was the next conference that I sort of instigated. And again, I, I'm really, you know, it was one of those things that 
as a national association, which the United Kingdom Lubricants Association is, which publishes magazine, um, does a very good job mm. for its membership, but it hadn't really run its own conferences. So I feel quite proud that those two quite uh, important events were held. And then, of course, I, I've now moved and I'm working for a, a different organisation. But, but I think championing women has always been something that I've always mm. had a natural affinity to. I think it's partly to do with, and I didn't sort of say, mention this to you earlier, but, you know, you and I both went to university in, in the UK. Well, I remember very, very uh, specifically my mum being very opposed to my going to higher education. She didn't want me to go. She didn't want me to go to university. She didn't want me to live in. She didn't want me to be out there um and so a, a meeting of the elders was called at my home uh, a patriarchal okay. meeting with uh, my mum being the only female there but you know my godfather mm -hmm. uncles my dad to discuss intervention to discuss whether it was appropriate for me to go wow. to university and it sounds really bizarre to think about that now and you know, but it was a real issue. My mum was really struggling mm. with the idea of me doing something as incredibly sort of out there um, at the time because it just was so alien to her mm. sensibilities, you know, all of those things. So I had to have this family conference, <laughs> patriarchal <laughs> conference, um, to determine whether I should go. And my, wow. my godfather, bless him, who's no longer with us, sadly, I said, you've got to give her whatever she wants, education is a good thing. Don't, you know, mm. don't hold her back. And so I think that must have subliminally triggered this women, you know, let's stand up and, and do something special for, not even special, just to kind of, you well, know, balance the, yeah. the the platform. So maybe that's how that sort of morphed. It's kind of, I think about it every now and again, and I wonder if that well, was... Well, there's, there's a lot of um, material there, though. I mean, it's interesting because all the all the sectors and the themes that you've been so integral to shaping in the UK are things that need ambassadors like you now in Cyprus. So I, for one... I'm ready. I'm ready. I, for one, I'm <laughs> very happy to hear that Aww. you're thinking of coming back. Um, and I did want to ask you, actually, because we've not, we've not really spoken much about the things that you do love about Cyprus. I want you to describe what Cyprus means to you in three words. And then maybe while you're doing that, just give us an indication of, of what it is that's pulling you back. You know, I this was a question I've been thinking about um, very deeply. Uh, I, and I know, okay, these are my, my three um, words or the three essences, if you like, that feel, mm -hmm. I feel compelled to share. The first is sanctuary, because Cyprus absolutely has been my sanctuary. When I came back with the boys for good, mm. although I had no idea I, I would be here for nine years, I thought I might just be here for a few months or get my head together, decide what I wanted to do. But this is definitely a sanctuary for me, Cyprus. Okay. Um, the second word And you know, my mind's just gone completely blank because I spirituality. That oh, was wow. it. Okay. Yeah, spirituality. And um I feel drawn to parts of Cyprus that I have kind of uncovered uh, over my my time on the island. Um where there's a real spiritual presence. I feel it mm. deep, deep down in my core. And you know, it sounds very trite, but I, I feel I've had real um, moments where I've been at one with with just nature, everything, you know, the world, whatever you want to call it, you know, for me, it's a very, very profound sense of spirituality that the site that the island offers. And the third is renewal. For me, this island is about renewal. And it has enabled me and facilitated renewal for me. Um, and I will forever be grateful and feel blessed that I've had that that um, occasion and that opportunity because I, I do feel I've been able to re-establish myself, 
rebuild myself, feel renewed in who I am, in how I look upon myself. And I, I will always be grateful for Cyprus for those reasons. I love that, Andrea. And thank you, because those, the beauty of that is that we've we've had loads of guests and you can tell who the writer is. There's those three... <laughs> Those three words are beautiful and, and there's, a, there's a depth to them, mm. a depth of expression and a little bit of pain perhaps yeah. as well. And uh, the, these are, ironically, I mean, these three words, renewal, spirituality and sanctuary, do allude to a sense of home as well, which mm. is nice because it's all about coming back to your authentic self and feeling at peace with yourself. And that, for me, is also yep. home. So... Beautiful. Thank you very much for your time. My it's pleasure. been Thank lovely to chat me. to you. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to a, a comeback. <laughs> yes, the yes. Enjoy, enjoy carnival and uh, enjoy the remaining days of your trip and we'll see you when you're back. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Andrianne. And everybody else, of course, thank you for uh, being with us. And don't forget, you can follow Destination Cyprus on your favourite podcast channel, on YouTube and all of Cybarco's social media pages. And we'll see you again next time for more chat about Cyprus. Destination Cyprus, brought to you by Cybarco.